Order, order. Nikki Aiken to move the motion. I beg to move that this House has considered fertility treatment and employment rights. It is a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, Sir Edward. This week, we mark National Fertility Awareness Week. So I'm incredibly grateful to have secured this important debate on fertility treatment and employment rights. Before I begin, I would like to put on record my heartfelt thanks to the incredible Fertility Matters at Work, Fertility Network UK, Burgess Me Family Law, and Dr. Michelle Weldon-Jones. These organisations and individuals have been instrumental in driving forward positive change in this arena, and I would not feel equipped to speak on this issue without their help. Fertility treatment affects hundreds of thousands of people from all ethnicities and socio-economic backgrounds. Infertility does not discriminate. It is emotionally draining, costly, risky, and often a long process. You can go through multiple cycles before conceiving. According to the latest figures from UK Fertility Regulator, the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority, it takes on average three cycles of IVF to achieve success. Cycles can be unpredictable, and women have to deal with the symptoms, the risk of complications, and the day-to-day -day practicality, such as self-injecting with hormones. Undergoing fertility treatment is difficult at the best of times, but undergoing treatment while juggling a job is particularly tough. Unlike employment legislation for pregnancy, maternity, and paternity leave, there is no enshrined legislation that compels employers to give time off work fertility treatment, or any initial consultation. The 2010 Employment Act was well-intentioned and did remove some forms of discrimination in the workplace. Unfortunately, though it does not help prevent discrimination against those pursuing fertility treatment, as it does not class infertility as a disability. Despite the World Health Organization describing infertility as, and I quote, a disease of the reproductive system. In practice, there is little recourse to legal, medical, practical and emotional support for both men and women undergoing fertility treatment. For example, most workplace protection policies exclude elective medical procedures, putting fertility treatment on a par with cosmetic surgery. And Mr Chairman, I'm sure you will forgive me if I say that we should not be equating fertility treatment with cosmetic surgery like a nose job or, dare I say, a boob job. Now, Certainly will. Great. She's got this debate. I'm really pleased that she has. And, um, I just wanted to, to, to back up what she's saying and that we, we, shouldn't treat, we should treat fertility as a medical issue, and we, and we do not. Um, and while nice guidance says that women should be able to access three full cycles, the reality, of course, is that that in itself would be cruel enough, three strikes and you're out. But the reality is that local decision-making often means that three cycles would be... <laughs> many people would, would love to get to three, but actually local decision means that they, they often don't even get two. So wouldn't she say that we need to, dare I say, level up fertility treatment across our constituencies? for the intervention and I absolutely agree that there's so much pressure on the NHS and to be able to provide people with proper fertility treatment that so many people have to then spend so much money on their savings, remortgage their homes to pay for private fertility treatment. So I hope that this debate today will lift the lid on the lottery that does still exist. <laughs> Mr Chairman, women are of course protected from pregnancy related unfair treatment and discrimination throughout the protective period. In the case of other fertility treatments, however, this protective period will only begin at the implantation stage, not before. This means that employers are, un are unlikely to be liable for pregnancy discrimination in relation to any unfair treatment prior to the implant implantation stage. This leaves people vulnerable to unfavourable treatment or dismissal during the earlier stages of treatment without any legal recourse. And data from Fertility Matters at Work shows that a third of people currently going through IVF treatment have considered leaving their job rather than face workplace discrimination. The findings also indicate that many do feel very uncomfortable discussing IVF treatment openly with their employer 
and so struggle through the journey largely unsupported and in silence. Some said that they fear it will be held against them um, and they won't be considered for the next promotion or they will actually even face redundancy. Of course. I thank her for making such a passionate speech on this really important issue. Currently, figures show that 3.5 million people in the UK are facing fertility issues. Does she feel that, you know, with so many people facing this, employers do need to look at how they come into the present current time and actually make sure that there's space for their staff to discuss this in the workplace? I thank the Honourable Member for Vauxhall for her intervention, and I completely agree. And I think one in six couples are experiencing fertility issues and therefore that is a huge number of people as you say working in this country and we must do to, to ensure we can retain these brilliant people in their jobs we must do more to support them at this very difficult and emotional time so uh so edward when uh from the from, from the um work that the fertility um uh fertility workplace matters people have done when they the, the research they've done they said that when people do speak to their employees Met employers, many felt that it was used against them um, for future opportunities progressing in their company. And for me, the realities of this issue was brought to light by a particular constituent of mine. And I have to commend her for her bravery for sharing her story with me, which led me to this campaign. She had been working in finance for 19 years. Uh, everything had been going well. She was a senior person in the organisation where she worked. Sadly, she had found she couldn't conceive naturally uh, and then realised that she had to go um, for IVF. Um, she did everything under the radar because she didn't feel that her employee, employer would be supportive. And she did go, go through the uh, process. Uh, but sadly, complications in the treatment led to her being in hospital for two weeks and then a further four weeks of recovery. And the hospital wrote her a sick note for her employer and that's when it said complications due to IVF. And the cat was out of the bag. She went back to work and um, the employer immediately called her into a meeting and uh, told her that she was being moved abroad. Uh, and uh, she had no choice. Uh, she stuck to her guns. Um, she went through the IVF, uh, went for the um, implantation, was told that if she went for the implantation, she, would be, uh, she could be sacked. Uh, she went for the implantation uh, and then she decided uh, that she would have to go off on stress. It's a question over a third of employees, as the Honourable uh, Member knows, uh, undergo fertility treatment. Over a third of those employees undergoing fertility treatment considered leaving their job uh, uh, because of those sort of problems. Um, and so wouldn't she agree with me that it isn't good for the economy, let alone the personal and financial circumstances for the person concerned, and that's why this debate is so important, and I thank her for initiating it. I thank the uh, Honourable Member for the intervention, and he's, again, absolutely right. We have got to ensure that we retain these brilliant people in their jobs. We have a million job vacancies, so we know how difficult it is to recruit people into jobs. So why do we try to make it as hard as possible to keep people when they're going through fertility treatment? But going back to my constituent, uh, she ended up... Uh, nearly to the door of an employment tribunal, but um, because of she was in early pregnancy, she didn't want the stress anymore, she was finding it difficult to pay for the lawyer's fees, she came to an agreement with her employer, signed an NDA, and uh, since then has um, been unable to speak about her case in public. Um, and I think that you know, she came to me in, um, in confidence, and that is why I have taken up this cause today and I thank her but she is not the only one. Since starting this campaign I have been uh, contacted uh, by thousands, uh, sorry, by scores of people but I know that thousands of women are affected by this every year and you know many uh, women have told me that by admitting they are undertaking IVF or any form of fertility treatment it can be c considered cons career suicide. I do not think we should be allowing women to feel that they have to put having a baby up against progressing their career. We, they, why can't they do both in the 21st century? Um, and so uh, I think it's really, really important that we do listen to these stories and that we turn these stories into reality so that we can provide women 
and their partners, and men, of course, uh, and, and, uh, and same-sex partners, with the respect and with the uh, protections that they need. Um, uh, after all, Mr Chairman, it is, as I said, 2022, not 1922, uh, and that is why I've started this campaign. The first part of my campaign is with my private members' bill, the Facility Treatment Employment Rights Bill, due to have its second reading on the 25th of November. Uh, the bill sets out to give indiv individuals the right to take time off for fertility treatment, just like they would if they had antenatal appointments. It is supported by leading charities and NGOs, as well as the Chartered Institute uh, of Professional Development. The bill goes hand in hand with the incredible work this government is already doing to support women in work, uh, be it that uh, through the menopause, for couples requiring neonatal leave or those having experienced baby loss. And I hope to see the government's full support during the, this bill's second reading. But beyond legislation, I, mean, I know how long it can take to get a, uh, a private member's bill through the House. There are steps that we can take now, and I firmly believe that we um, also need to encourage employers to take proactive steps to support people undergoing fertility treatment now, this day. That's why during this week, National Fertility Awareness Week, I, have, I am launching my Fertility Workplace Pledge. This pledge calls for employers of all shapes and sizes to lead the way and voluntarily sign up to a clear set of commitments. Accessible information, awareness in the workplace, staff training, and crucially, flexible working. Tomorrow morning, I am holding an event here in Parliament, and you are all invited, uh, which brings together experts, academics, and leading businesses who I'm delighted to say have already signed up to a pre-launch of the Fertility Workplace Pledge, including NatWest Bank, Metro Bank, Zurich, Channel 4, The Co-op, Cadent Gas, UK Hospitality, a huge array of UK law firms, and, in particular, I'm very proud that the House of Commons has also agreed to take part. By signing the Fertility Workplace Pledge, all these organisations will improve their workplace culture and the well-being of their staff, which in turn reduces stress, sick leave and safeguards against retention of employees. And importantly, it will put no unnecessary burden on their businesses. It shows that businesses are supportive of the key principles of my bill. And we must remember that this pledge is a voluntary action on their part. And no matter how hard we try, without the necessary legislation, the necessary protections, thousands will still be left vulnerable to discrimination. So, Edward, there are so many misconceptions about fertility treatment, especially in the workplace. Many think it's a lifestyle choice for older career women who have waited too long before trying to start a family. This could be no further from the truth. More than 40% of women resorting to the treatment are under 35, and many turn to IVF for medical reasons, such as having gone through early menopause or cancer treatment. It is also a route to having a family for LGBT couples, as well as those who do not have a partner or are clinically infertile. People should never be penalised because they cannot conceive naturally. It is now time to recognise fertility treatment as a very, very important part of reproduction. We've got a falling birth rate here in this country. We cannot put unnecessary hurdles in the way of people who want to start a family. And, all, and after all, our children are our country's future. So we must support everyone going through fertility treatments in order to conceive and give them the employment rights that they need and they deserve. Thank you. The question is, is this House have considered fertility treatment and employment rights? Well, if everyone's going to get in, no more than absolute five minutes maximum, please. Jim Shannon. Um, yeah, always a pleasure to speak in any debate in Westminster Hall, and thanks to yourself for being able to serve under your chairmanship. I'd like to commend the Honourable Lady for Cities of London and Westminster for, uh, for leading the debate today. I, I have some uh, of my constituents back home that uh, referred me to the Honourable Lady and, 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 and uh, the debate she was asking for, so I'm very pleased to, to, to participate in that. I thank her for her ongoing interventions uh, and, and the introduction of her private members' bill on, on fertility treatment and employment rights, and I look forward to hearing further contributions from others in the Chamber from both sides. Uh, always a pleasure to see 
my good friend from Romsey and Southampton South, North, sorry, I got it wrong, um, um, uh, here as well. And, and, and we do seem to be um, uh, com, uh, in the same side when we come to these debates as always. So it's good to see our place as well. This is an unfortunate and sad reality that faced many women and, and couples uh, wanting to have children that natural conception is not always an option and seeking fertility treatment is the most viable option. Uh, across the UK, some 1.3 million IVF cycles have resulted in the birth of 390,000 babies. That's one in three, which means that there's unfortunately two out of every three that, that aren't successful, uh, and, and that's a reality as well. IVF and other fertility treatments are incredibly common. Nowadays, yet the provision of employment rights for women undertaking this treatment is feeble. And I use that word, I could use stronger words, Mr Chairman, uh, or Sir Robert, but it wouldn't be appropriate, but it is feeble. And again, we look to the Minister to, to strengthen what the Honourable Lady wants to bring forward, and which I believe everyone in this House today uh, wants to see happening as well. Similarly, in some cases, men require time off for the sampling or the consultancy appointments, and there is no clarity in terms of employment rights for this too. Again, uh, there is two in this, uh, as, as often in, in, in this equation, uh, and, and I think the, the issue for the lady who wants to conceive and, and, and the man who, who wants to um, uh, also be part of that there, I think it is important to have that as well. And employer discretion has played a very pivotal role in deciding uh, a, a time off for fertility treatment. There are no specific UK rights. There should be. The Honourable Ladies' debate, our, our, our bill will perhaps maybe change things. In addition, this is not an issue which applies solely to small businesses. Often large chain stores across the UK have no specific guidelines whatsoever in relation to employment rights in terms of fertility and, and really have no desire to even try and, and address those issues either. One constitutive man who is only 24 stated to me, uh, and it is quite an interesting point, that if she was trying to conceive naturally, there would be no expectation to tell her employee she is trying for a baby. However, given she had to go down the IVF route, she had an obligation to tell her employer, because of the appointments, the test and additional time off she would need. Is there not something that doesn't add up there? Uh, uh, certainly in my, in my book, it's quite clear, uh, and, and, and others will, will reiterate that. In another instance, I had a, had a woman contact me office just at the tail end of the third lockdown. Her employer stated that if her IVF appointment took over three hours, including travel time, she would be forced to take holidays. And if a uh, um, you know, human HR considered that you were attending too many appointments, you would have to take, make up the time yourself. Compassion, understanding, wow, big lack of, lack of both there in, in that case. But the chairman lies with the fact that couples should not be penalised for fertility issues that lie completely out of their control. There is, in addition, a huge mental strain on both men and women while seeking fertility treatment, stress and anxiety. Uh, the, the ladies have come to see me over the years as, as an elected representative, uh, as an MLA in the previous uh, job I had and, and as MP here. Uh, uh, they, they sit there and, 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 and their faces betray the stress and the anxiety that they have. Uh, so so I, I just think that we, we need to do better. Of the 3.5 million uh, people in the UK and 5% of people in Northern Ireland struggle to naturally get pregnant, we must do more to normalise the fact that there is a right to these appointments, as there is a right to a GP appointment or a dental appointment. Uh, a woman's ovulation can't be pinned to a certain day off or to a lunchtime break, and there must be flexibility as a norm. Um, consideration must be given to the overall cost of the process too for those employees who are not being paid for their appointments or been taken, made to do to take statutory sick pay. There is often already extreme financial pressures going on through the cost of, I, of IVF treatment. Additional pressures by employers is unnecessary and, un, and furthermore unfair. Uh, Nor 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 NI Direct has also stated that you have been entitled to paid time off for antenatal care only after the fertilised embryo, uh, embryo has been implanted. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, understanding, not even within the department, for goodness sake, is endless. Forgetting that many cases, the most appointments and check-ups are before implant um, implantation. These are the issues we, which we must be focused on, 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 on time on. To conclude, Mr Chairman, uh, I have high hopes, very high hopes, for the, the Honourable Lady's uh, uh, private member's bill. And as my party's spokesperson for health, I support it and its intentions fully. I, I hope for a future for couples that mean that they can get the support from their employees as needed, both before implantation and after. We all want the best for our constituents. So it is crucial we stand here today you and represent them and, and, and who are faced with the difficulties of fertility and managing employment. Thank you very much. Caroline Oates. Thank you, sir.
Edward, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And I would like to congratulate my honourable friend from the cities of London and Westminster for having secured this important debate and the introduction that she gave to it. I am equally delighted to see the minister in her place and, am I allowed to say, slightly relieved that we have a Bayes minister here to talk about fertility and work because too often in this place I come in to talk about the menopause and work and I'm confronted with a health minister. So it would be expected of me to start instantly with a pitch for an employment bill because I make that pitch every time I come in here and say we need to have an employment bill. We were promised it in the Queen's speech some years ago. It's still not forthcoming. I'm going to put it in the hands of my good friend from the Wealdon to produce the aforementioned bill. But I would like to pay tribute to my honourable friend for having secured the PMB slot and for making progress in that regard. We do need to see some legislation around this because make no mistake, this is a women in work issue and I know that that's very gendered and I'm going to move away from that in a moment but it is about securing women's place in the workplace about making sure that they keep those opportunities and it is very much as the honourable gentleman from Bootle said this is a fiscal issue this is about the individual fiscal well-being of families and of the economy as a whole there are very uh, a few points that I want to make and I'm only going to be brief but we've heard it explained by other members in here that two-thirds of IVF cycles uh, or two-thirds of parents going through IVF it ends in failure. It's a really gruelling and stressful process which is why flexibility employment, why adequate time off is so important. It's why we need employers to be understanding and often we talk about mental health in the workplace. I know I've spent the last 18 months talking about menopause in the workplace and the importance of having policies in place in the workplace that support individual employees that have a culture of openness so we're not having the secrecy uh, and the shame and the fear of coming forward with these issues so that people can be supported to take off the time that they need that it shouldn't be part of their holiday entitlement because we've heard it can be long and grueling and actually most people's holiday entitlements simply wouldn't be enough now look i said i'd made it a gendered issue and it isn't because the reality is, is that partners need to be there to support uh, the woman that is going through IVF. And we must recognise the need for same-sex same couples to have that support and the need for this sort of support to be available when surrogates are used. And the reality is, is that we might like to think about traditional uh, family units, but families come in all sorts of shapes and sizes nowadays. And it's absolutely crucially important that we recognise the role uh, that there needs to be for LGBT couples as well in getting this sort of support. Look, there are some great examples out there. When I look at companies like NatWest, like Centrica, who have really led the way in fertility policies in the workplace. And I was really pleased to hear from the co-op, who employ in the region of 60,000 people in this country. Even in the last few weeks, they have published their paid leave for fertility treatments policy and have made the point that the time off that they provide is flexible. It's unrestricted. And they make the point that they can't assume what individuals going through fertility treatment need. And of course, the measures extend to partners accompanying those going for fertility treatments with paid leave for up to 10 appointments per cycle. And that really does give you an idea of the measure of how significant a commitment this is, both from individual and indeed employer. Look, I think we have a great deal of work to do in this area. It is too little understood and too little spoken about. But I would like to pay tribute to my honourable friend for the great work she's doing in Fertility Awareness Week to raise this issue. Oh, look hard. Apologies. Um, thank you, uh, Mr Chairman, uh, Sir Edward. And can I thank the member for Cities of London and Westminster for securing this debate. It certainly is an important issue and one but as a female MP, I do get lobbied on regularly. I'm sure we all know of couples mm -hmm. who have gone through the IVF journey. No couple would choose to have to go down this pathway to start a family. And I know, speaking with many couples, they have told me of the physical, mental, emotional roller coaster, uh, one of hope, disappointment, of joy, and despair. For some, it brings that little bundle of enjoyment and for others, it does bring that heartache. So Edward, I know that in the midst of such a journey, to be fully focused on work, to be in the right frame of mind to work, to be physically capable of work, is undoubtedly for some just too much. And it is wrong 
that there is currently no legal entitlement to time off in such circumstances. Members will know that as the law currently stands prior to embryo transfer while undergoing, IVF employees have limited IVF specific protection. Most of their legal protections stem from standard employment protections to prevent discrimination. In such unique circumstances as these, a unique legal provision for additional employment rights are needed. And I'm conscious, as uh, the member for Cities of London and Westminster has tabled uh, a private member's bill to address this lack of legal provision for women uh, being given time off, and, and we as a party will be supporting uh, that, that bill. This is on the basis that IVF treatment should be categorised as an antenatal and thus patients be given the same work rights. That, to me, is a sensible provision and one which I will be fully supportive of uh, as it progresses through the House. Uh, Sir Edward, briefly let me make mention of one other fact. For many, this is a multi-cycle experience. And unfortunately, in Northern Ireland, we still have a situation where uh, couples are only entitled to one uh, cycle of IVF. And that is very distressing to couples, puts more pressure on couples. Within the new decade, new approach um, document that restored the devolved administrations, there was a commitment to providing IVF uh, three cycles. Unfortunately, that hasn't been fulfilled. This government last week moved on fulfilling part of NDNA in terms of the culture mm -hmm. and identity bill, but yet this, which brings about new life, mm -hmm. and uh, hasn't been fulfilled. So I would encourage the minister on this issue uh, to, uh, to take it up and run with it and, uh, and allow this government to deliver on that promise within NDNA. We want a society that values life. We want a culture yeah. where women feel valued. Women uh, go through much in the workplace, often miscarriage, a pregnancy, IVF, menopause. Employers need to support women yeah, yeah. in the workplace, and therefore that. this debate is very welcome. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Sir. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. I too would like to congratulate my honourable friend on her wonderful campaign. Uh, and, and if I can support it, I will do so. This morning, by coincidence, we were having a discussion about general um, uh, uh, cultural things around, uh, uh, around getting pregnant. And the, the conclusion of it was that if a man uh, ha has a child, if you see what I mean, that was an excuse for the employer to give him a pay rise and to change his job. If a woman got pregnant, she was just put to one side. Now, we've heard how the whole process uh, of uh, uh, fertility treatment is very stressful. And in fact, we have only heard a portion of it because if, if you read the, the number of tests that they have to have um, and, and, and the, 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 the details of, of how they go through this, um, you will see how, how very frightening it, it can be. And uh, I, I think we have to remember the, the, the effect that that stress can have on people's work. But it's not just women who are involved in this. Males can have infertility problems as well that can be due to lifestyle habits, for example, smoking, or can be due to hormonal changes, for example, in low testosterone. And what all of that uh, leads to is, is some figures that I saw that, uh, that in fact had been produced by AXA. Um, and, and, and one of the most important of those was that 85% of employees who were undergoing fertility treatment had already said that it had had a negative impact on their work. That is a phenomenal number of people who uh, are involved in this where, where it has a profoundly negative uh, impact on, on their work. And, and we've already heard that, um, in fact, I think the, the figure that I saw was 38%, so it's a little higher than a third, uh, had already considered or actually had quit their job as a result of the impact, particularly on their mental health. 
And, and although we have tried to separate mental health from, from other reasons uh, for, for um, uh, approaching this, this subject, we cannot separate them. They are intimately linked. And, and, and the mental health applications that, 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 that take place in this have to be looked at very, very carefully and, and with a great deal of, of, of consideration. I cannot understand why a business does not want to give uh, time uh, sp specifically allocated for, for fertility treatment. I cannot understand why it is not part of their natural, compassionate uh, approach to dealing with employees. They, they are compassionate in many other ways, uh, and, and that is to be applauded. But, but in this, I cannot understand when it directly affects the work that people undertake, when it directly affects the way in which they look at, look at how they operate there, I cannot understand why, why businesses do not uh, do that. So I am very pleased with the number of companies that my honourable friend has already uh, um, signed up to, to her campaign, uh, and um, I, I look forward to, 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 to their involvement and to being able to, to, to take this forward. This, as we have heard, is a major problem uh, for, uh, not just for this country, uh, but certainly for, 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 the, for the Western world. Uh, and, and I think unless we take it seriously, we will end up in even greater trouble uh, than we would otherwise. And I thank my honourable friend for the work that she has done to make sure that we are all aware of this. Mr. Crawley. Sir Edward, it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship and I would like to congratulate the Honourable Member for the Cities of London and Westminster for securing this incredibly important debate and for all of her work in Parliament on the Fertility Treatment Employment Rights Bill. I wish her every success with her second reading of the bill. I welcome the Base Minister to our place and I hope that we will continue to have fruitful discussions on, among many issues, my bill on miscarriage leave, which I will undoubtedly continue to lobby her on. Um, now, we've heard from many people across the Chamber today about National Fertility Awareness Week, and therefore I am very grateful that we're having this debate. Um, we've heard from the Honourable Member for Frankford, as always, on his passionate conveyance of his constituents, the Honourable Member for Romsey and Southampton, and the importance of changes to workplace cultures and the reflection of modern families and the different routes to parenthood. Um, but, Chair, Currently in the UK, there are around three and a half million people who, as we have heard, experience fertility treatment for several reasons, but although the most commonly issues of infertility, however, an increasing number of same-sex couples are undergoing treatment to start their own families, as well as a growing number of individuals adopt, opting to preserve their fertility are among the, the reasons that many are undergoing treatment. Now, while advances and assisted fertility have allowed many more families who are unable to conceive without assistance through donor sperm or egg donation to opt for treatments such as IVF, IUI, as well as surrogacy. Sadly, this issue continues to be shrouded in secrecy and an element of stigma. As we have heard, for those who have that lived experience, they do not appear to have a voice in this process. Um, that means that millions of UK citizens are facing the prospect of fertility treatment alone and in silence. And as we have already heard, there is no specific rights within the UK law to protect those who need time off. Now, no doubt the Minister will give the same response. I hope she won't, but she may. That I have repeatedly raised on several occasions regarding my own bill to introduce paid miscarriage leave for couples experiencing pregnancy loss before 24 weeks. But I will once more take this opportunity to remind her that the introduction of an employment bill would have addressed many of these issues of guaranteed rights for workers. And it's unfair that any employee should have to take annual leave for medical related appointments or even to take time off the process of what is an already arduous process. Fertility treatment is undoubtedly one of the most challenging experiences that a couple can undertake. It's, it's precarious, unpredictable and uncertain. Trying to plan for hormone cycles, for treatment, for blood appointments, Nothing can prepare you for what you will go through and the time that you will need from your employer can change and can be fairly unpredictable, which is why it's essential that we have an understanding of the impact and the emotional impact that infertility can have um, cannot be underestimated. It can be both traumatic and emotionally draining. It can be arduous and long. It can take months, it can take years. 
And for couples who have continue to go through that process, it can result in many unsuccessful attempts. Until you've gone through it yourself, you will never fully appreciate how challenging it is. I just want to end with testimony from a couple who wrote to me to say our, our plan was to grow our family. We saved, we planned for fertility. We didn't plan for a global pandemic, cancelled treatment cycles. We didn't anticipate how long our treatment would take and the possibility that it may not work. Thankfully, after several failed embryo transfers, we're now beginning to feel the excitement of being 16 weeks pregnant. But the journey steamrolls ahead and it's hard to stop and reflect on the pains and the heartaches that came with this. It's, a, it's surrendering control to that little life when it decides to join us and it's nothing short of a lesson in patience and gratitude. The reality is nothing can prepare you for fertility treatment. So I'm asking the minister today, will she commit to signal to those undergoing fertility treatment and commit to bringing forward statutory rights for workers th through the fertility treatment in law? And will she hopefully commit to the introduction of an employment law bill, which we have a long awaited over successive parliaments? It's high time the government took action to bring the employment law up to date in this country. Be it fertility, miscarriage leave, or enacting the TLA review, I urge the minister to act now and introduce leave for so many couples who need work. Justin Matters. Thank you, sir. Edwin, it's a pleasure to see you in the chair once again this afternoon. Um, can I first of all start by congratulating the Honourable Member of the City of London and Westminster for uh, securing this debate and the excellent uh, uh, speech that she gave. She said that uh, there was little legal, medical, practical and emotional support for those seeking fertility treatment. I think that absolutely encapsulates the very broad issues uh, that face uh, people in this situation and obviously we're, we're looking at a very a specific part of it today. Um, I agree with her when she said that uh, this should not be considered on a par with cosmetic surgery. It's a very different thing altogether. And I think uh, it, it really sort of brought it home to me just how far we need to, to move forward with the example she gave of the constituent of hers who was told that she would be sacked if uh, uh, she undertook IVF treatment. That's the sort of conversation that you would have expected in the 70s to someone who said that they were uh, pregnant and uh, rightly society and the law have said that that kind of response is unacceptable. And, and I think she, she summed it up very well when she, when she said that people should not be penalised because they cannot conceive uh, naturally. Um, there were a lot of good speeches from, from uh, backbenchers today. Uh, as, as always, the Honourable Member for Strangford uh, uh, gave, gave a good contribution. Uh, I think everyone was, was pretty much in agreement about the importance of this area. I just wanted to, to, to really just uh, uh, draw attention to the comments from the Honourable Member for Romsey in Southampton North, who uh, I think she said it, it, she does an excellent job in, in all sorts of areas in terms of equality in the workplace. She said it really is about uh, creating a culture of openness and support for employees, and I think that that is something that uh, this debate can hopefully uh, engender. She also asked uh, about an employment bill now. Uh, the, the minister today is, is, is standing in, but she, she, will, she may know that I've asked her many predecessors when we can expect that bill, and I'm afraid... Uh, I'm not expecting uh, an answer, so for the Honourable Member over there, I suspect it will take a Labour government to bring forward the plethora of employment legislation that this country so desperately needs. But I'm very grateful for, for the Honourable Member for bringing this debate forward today, because it is an issue that traditionally has not received the attention that it deserves, because it is something that understandably people find it difficult to talk about, but it's that culture of openness that we need to uh, foster. So, as we have heard, infertility and fertility treatment is, in fact, the second most common reason for a woman to visit their GP, with actually the most common reason being pregnancy. And we've heard around one in seven couples are affected by infertility, which is around three and a half million people in the UK. And since 1991, there have been 1.3 million IVF cycles uh, undertaken, resulting in 390,000 babies being born. But even though we can see in those three decades, actually just how more commonplace IVF has become. There are now um, uh, from 6,700 IVF cycles taking place in 1991, there were 69,000 cycles in 2019. Um, I doubt that a tenfold increase in awareness of employers has actually uh, accompanied that increase in uh, IVF treatment, which is why this debate today is so important. Uh, oh, I will. There is a group that are not included in that figure for whom all of these issues around fertility challenge don't exist because they're banned from it. So current legislation means that people living with HIV are, are, are banned from using fertility treatment. 
No, no I, I, HIV medication is so effective these days that you cannot pass it on. So babies can be born without HIV. So there's no medical reason for this law to exist. And I just wonder whether the opposition are aware of that and whether they think that that is a really brutal bit of discrimination that belongs to another age. Well, I thank the Honourable Member for his intervention. I wasn't aware of that, and obviously that is uh, a matter that comes within the uh, Department of Health's bailiwick, so I would have to defer to my shadow colleagues. But perhaps in a few days he will have a new role which will enable him to uh, put a focus on this issue uh, in a way that we haven't seen so far. But we've heard uh, a number of statistics, Sir Edward, uh, about why this is such an important issue in the workplace. The uh, Fertility Network UK said that... Uh, 56% of those uh, seeking treatment reported decreased job satisfaction, 63% admitted reduced engagement, 36% had increased sickness absences, and 38% had seriously considered leaving their job or actually quit their job trying to conceive. That, that is a statistic that should uh, shame us all. And recent research published by Jura Gossel found that 58% of women undergoing IVF treatment withheld this information from their employer, and 12% left their job completely due to their employer being unsupportive. That is a statistic that we absolutely have to challenge and change. And it is easy to see why uh, those undergoing fertility treatment report uh, those experiences. Um, from both what we've heard today and uh, from issues we've heard in the media, it is easy to, easy to see why so many uh, people, particularly women, report feeling vulnerable and distressed about talking with these issues with their employer. And I think we, we, almost all in society are sensitive to how emotionally challenging and stigmatising seeking the support can be. But the reality of having to physically administer treatment whilst you're in the workplace, possibly alone in a toilet stall, must feel extremely difficult for those who are having to do it. And having the fear that actually your line manager might be questioning where you are when taking that treatment uh, can only add to the anxiety people feel. And then you've got the issue whether, whether the treatment you're having will negatively impact on your career because you have an unsympathetic line manager. Uh, you, it, it can be a very isolating experience and I think we've got to change the culture uh, to make sure that women feel supported and not alone during these times. And I think in conclusion, Sir Edward, these statistics and the testimony that we've heard today should give us all food for thought about whether we've actually got the balance right um, and whether there is sufficient support for those uh, with fertility issues. I think the, the overwhelming uh, picture we've been hearing today is that we haven't got that balance right at all. Minister. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, Sir Edward Lee. I am indeed standing in for the member for Serska Moulton, but I do want to put on the record that we do work as a team within Bayes, and it's absolutely spot on that Bayes is responding to this debate today. Yes. I want to congratulate the Honourable Member for Cities of London and Westminster for securing today's important debate on fertility fertility treatment and employment rights. We've heard so many shocking stories that have impact women, couples and families about the impact of this evasive treatment. But I just want to take a moment and say we've probably all been a little bit complicit, haven't we? So many of us will know girlfriends, family members, colleagues who wanted to keep this a secret and we've kept it a secret for them because they were anxious about how they would be you know, the behaviour they may receive at work. So it's so important to get this out into the open. And I want to just pay my tribute to the member for cities of London and Westminster that putting together the Fertility Workplace Pledge will be a fantastic contribution that she's made whilst her career in, in Parliament. And it's only just begun. So thank you so much for, for bringing this to the fore. We've had a lot of discussions around the challenges in fertility treatment um, the impact it has on, on women and couples, but also the impact it has potentially on their employment as well. We've heard about the statistics. There are so many people going through this, so it's shocking that it's still a secret. In 2019, about 53,000 patients had 69,000 IVF cycles and 5,700 donor insemination cycles at licensed fertility clinics in the UK. Um, the statistics are huge. So the fact that women and couples feel they can't talk about it in case they're treated in an inappropriate fashion, it is shocking. Um, so Fertility Awareness Week, just this week, is a, a superb contribution. Starts off with fertility fairness, fertility in the workplace, and evolves into him fertility. It's great to see some male contributions here today. Um, fertility education and talk fertility as well. I want to pay tribute to everyone that's contributed today. The members from Strangford, Upper Ban, Romsey, Southampton and North, who dare challenge the 
head of the Select Committee. The member for Winchester, with his tremendous record on health, I'm also a bit anxious about responding to his point. And of course, the member for Henley, he always speaks so sensibly as well. I just want to quickly go through some of the work that the government is doing and, and hopefully respond to some of the questions laid out as well. There's no denying that IVF is one of the most evasive fertility treatments. I don't understand why anybody would compare it to um, a, a procedure that is cosmetic, that just is absurd. It is evasive, it is gruelling, it is stressful, and it could last for years. We all have girlfriends who started a process, and they take up many, many years, um, and the impact it has on them financially as well. So there's no denying it is an incredibly difficult thing to do. Also, injecting is a private matter, and many women would want to have that private space to be able to inject themselves as well. And what we're talking about here today is the fact that women and couples just can't come forward and explain that they're going through this treatment because they're anxious about how they're going to be treated in the workplace. And as it's been brought up today, this is also an absurd anomaly because we are struggling to fill jobs and we want skilled people who are loyal, who understand the workplace, to remain in work. So something isn't quite right here. So we know that the situation has to change. It is cultural because we want people to be able to come forward and to present what they are going through and have the support that they need within the workplace as well. So we obviously need a cultural change, which is why the pledge is so important. Sometimes it's quicker to get business to move than it is for government. So once again, congratulations to my, for my colleague for putting that pledge in place. Um, if I just reflect on some of the work that is being done within government, so we have the women's health strategy, and that looks at the system as a whole, educating society at large, and also looking at the role that the health sector and employers and individuals can have in place as well. This summer, it was published the first government-led women's health strategy for England, and also was appointed a women's health ambassador to drive system-level changes to close the gender health gap. And the theme of the Health and Wellbeing Fund 22-2025 is, is women's reproductive well-being in the workplace. And the fund supports organisations to expand and develop projects to support women experiencing reproductive health issues to remain in or return to the workplace. Um, the government also has an active agenda on work and health more widely. We really want employers and employees in the round to have better interactions about work and health. And this is particularly important in tackling some of the perception issues around women's health generally and IVF specifically. The government's response to the Health is Everyone's Business consultation was published in July 2021 and it sets out some of the measures we will take to reduce health-related job losses. That was spoken about today and that is obviously a major issue that needs to be addressed. Health is Everyone's Business did not consult on infertility or any of the specific conditions. It looked at system-level measures to support employers and employees and manage any health conditions in the workplace there. And there's been some conversations around the... Um, the Employment Rights Bill and why it was not in the Queen's speech. I know it was raised by the member for Lanark and Hamilton East as well as Romsey and Southampton North. We are obviously disappointed that the Queen's speech did not include an employment bill for the third session of this Parliament. But there are some good things that have come out recently which are cross-party. I know my, my um, colleague wanted to have a little pop at the Conservative Party, but we do work with members across the House. And that's the, those are the numerous private member bills that have been introduced on the matter of employment rights as a result of the PMB ballot. And in particular, the neonatal care, leave and pay bill, the employment allocation of tips bill, the protection from redundancy, pregnancy and family leave bill, the carers leave bill, and the flexible working employment relations bill. So there is good work being done through the private members bill, even though we may not have the employment bill that everybody is asking for here. And I, I just want to mention um, to the member for the cities of London and Westminster that her private member bill will require employers to allow employees to take time off for appointments for fertility treatment, as she said. Um, and I know that um, the, the minister responsible will be engaging with her um, intensely before the, the, the appropriate time is made available for the bill to be heard again in, um, in the other chamber. Um, existing right and entitlements, I am anxious that we don't put across too much of a negative story because there is some good stuff out there already. Even though there's no overarching right for time off for medical appointments, there are a number of ways which employees may be able to take time off to attend medical employments, including IVF. I don't want anyone listening today feeling any more stressed than they already are if they are considering or going through IVF. Many employers are willing to agree informal, flexible working arrangements on a short-term basis. An individual may be able to take annual leave and an individual may agree general unpaid leave with their employer. But I think fundamentally the pledge 
campaign that my right hand friend has put in place will really challenge some of those employers that have quite an old-fashioned view. And I think it would be a badge of honour for these firms to say, we have this in place, because it not only will it attract new staff, but retain the staff they have as well. We know that if an individual is unwell, they can take a period of sickness absence and may be entitled to statutory or occupational sick pay. Um, we can't legislate to make employers act with compassion. But we know if employers want to employ committed employees, this is one of the things that they can do, which is adopting the Fertility Workplace Pledge. I think it's a really positive step in taking this agenda forward. For, forwards. And as we've already heard, a number of employees have already signed up. So I think, no doubt, over a period of time, it will just grow and grow. I just want to now reference some of the comments that were made by, by our colleagues here. The member for Winchester spoke about nice guidance of three opportunities at IVF. I'm speaking outside my brief that falls with the Department for Health, but uh, I just wanted to respond that we, we recognise that the NHS funded access to fertility services has been varied for a long time, and our ambition is to see an end to postcode lottery, and government is publishing, has published the health strategy in July this year and made a commitment to address the geographical variations over the lifetime of the strategy, which is indeed 10 years, no doubt. And my right hand friend will carry on campaigning for that as well. Um, I know that the member for Lanark and Hamilton talked about miscarriage leave. Um, uh, once again, it's outside of Bayes, it falls within Department for Health, but um, I just want to make it clear that obviously it, it's a, a miscarriage, it's very, indeed. With the Bayes portfolio, because it's about the right to pay the leave, so it specifically actually does sit within the Bayes portfolio. I was just going to make a little response to that as well. Hopefully it will provide some satisfaction. But um, it, obviously a miscarriage is a personal experience and there are opportunities to try and request time away from work. And we, we, we need to make sure that employers understand that. And, and, if, and also one of the programmes today, the pledge, for example, is one way of getting employers to understand how important it is to treat their employees with due care if they want to retain people within work. I think I covered the points that the Romsley and Southampton North colleague made. I'm just going through my notes. If I haven't, I'm sure she will pop up and um, intervene, but she hasn't, so I believe that she is satisfied, which is a wonderful place to be, sir, Edward Lee, when it comes to that particular member. So, I am not directly responsible for this brief, but I just want to be able to confirm with the colleague this is something that I am incredibly passionate about because I know so many people have gone through this and I feel that um, now that we're here in Parliament is something that we could um, promote in particular and to stop women being discreet about something that is so difficult and that is so evasive. I've already set out some of the government's activity in supporting health issues, in particular those going, uh, undergoing IVF. We've talked about how difficult it is to employ retain um, loyal staff and this is one way of dealing with that issue so it doesn't make sense why I wouldn't uh, sign up to the fertility workplace pledge and I encourage my right of a friend to do as much work as she can to promote the companies that do and out the companies that don't and I'm in incredibly determined to work with all my colleagues within Bayes to make sure we're playing a full role in driving this agenda forward. I want to close by thanking everyone once again for this helpful and informative debate. It's very important that we talk about this openly and I, I wish the member luck with the progress of a private member's bill. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Edward. I'd like to thank everybody today for taking part in what I think is a, such an important debate. When I um, was first contacted by my constituent that I mentioned in my speech earlier, I, I was uh, not aware, to be honest, that people undergoing fertility treatment didn't uh, receive employment rights. They couldn't take time off uh, paid leave to undertake their fertility treatment. And I think that is wrong. And I hope that by raising this issue in Parliament, we can give people who are going through fertility treatment, who may go through it in the future, that, that, that they are supported by this Parliament and by businesses across the country. We must lift this taboo and make sure that people who want to speak about it, and some people will want to keep it quiet, and that we respect that. But for people who want that support, they deserve to have that support from their employer. And I really do hope that we can get this private member's bill through or that the government will adopt it eventually when, when we have an employment bill. Um, I would just like to uh, end, uh, Sir Edward, by just re 
basically re-saying, if, if you like, that I believe business leaders um, who are serious about inclusion and ser serious about retention must be willing to discuss fertility openly and create policies to support employees in that phase in their life. And although I do hope the legislation can get through, in the meantime, I do have this uh, fertility workplace pledge, which will provide uh, accessible information, awareness in the workplace, staff training and flexible working. And I do hope that more and more businesses, big and small, will take part in this workplace pledge and sign up to it and give the, their employees the, uh, the support that they deserve. And I would ask all honourable members who are available tomorrow to pop into room R in PCH and support the workplace, the fertility workplace pledge by having your photograph taken and speaking to the experts who are there. So Edward, I think this is just the start and I want to really ensure that people who are going through fertility treatment, that they do feel heard, they do feel supported and that they do get the, uh, the rights that they all deserve because we do need more babies in this country, whether they are uh, natural or through fertility treatment and it is just a plain fact that if we are going to continue to grow our economy, we need more babies. So let's ensure that people undergoing fertility treatment have that support. The question is this House has to consider fertility treatment and employment rights. Many of that didn't say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order, order. Thank you. The proceeding is currently in private.